Thanks for tuning into The Reason We Learn. If you're not already a subscriber to this channel, please consider subscribing. Just hit the button and also the notification bell so you'll be notified when I make new content. I don't usually get political on this channel, but I'm going to make probably a few exceptions this election season. Not so much to be political, but to respond with my views in so far as they touch on things that I've talked about on this channel. And one of those is the idea of transing children. I bring this up because on my ex account the other day, I reminded my followers that there is another choice. So a lot of people were complaining about their two choices. I said, you do realize there's somebody else running and that's Chase Oliver. And I received a lot of comments along the lines of, you do understand he supports trans and kids. Now I know that not to be true in the, in the strictest definition of, it, you know, tra he supports trans and kids, meaning like, oh, your kid says they're a girl or a boy when they were born, you know, not, uh, sure. No problem. Just go ahead and let them do whatever. I know for a fact, that's not what he thinks, but I wanted to see where people were getting that idea and why they, you know, thought that. And, um, somebody shared with me something from 2022 where he said he thought that, uh, puberty blockers were mostly reversible or whatever, which we now know is not the case. But a lot of people, to be fair, a lot of people two years ago did not know that as well as they know it now. And you might tell, he should know. He doesn't have children. Why, why should he know? Not everybody who runs for public office knows everything about everything. Now, they should learn about it. But when you consider the fact that he's running for federal office and the federal government doesn't really get involved with your medical decisions or shouldn't, and we'll go into more depth on that. I don't think it's top of his list. I think things like understanding what causes inflation, you know, uh, understanding what to do in an, a national crisis or an international crisis would be, you know, higher up on the, on the food chain. Now, as bad as the whole trans craze is and everything that's going on, I'm looking more at governors, legislatures, doctors, therapists, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm looking at the people who, actually claim they're supposed to know these things and are much more directly involved in it than the person who might want to be president. But leaving that aside, I thought, okay, two years have gone by. Let's see what he says now. And somebody sent me this video from Reason where he's sort of debating with Liz Wolf, who's supposed to be a libertarian. This is fascinating to me. And we're going to react and I'm going to give you my two cents. Hopefully those of you who follow me, who have subscribed to the channel for a while know that you'd be hard pressed to find somebody more opposed to the idea that, you know, a kid who says they're the opposite sex just is. That I don't believe there's such a thing as being born in the wrong body. I do believe that gender dysphoria is real. Gender confusion is real. And I do believe it needs to be treated properly with the right kind of care. We don't just ignore it, nor do I think we just affirm it. So I've made my position very clear over the years on that. I don't think I need to uh, defend myself or my position, but I do want to explain why his position doesn't bother me, which may shock you. You might be like, uh -huh. so uh, that's why I'm here to explain. So let's take a look at what they have to say. Okay, here we go. Specific uh, criticisms that uh, the, the, the surfaced in the backlash to your nomination just because there's been a lot of stuff floating around about what your positions are or are not. I saw that you actually had to correct a uh, the isidewith.com website, which uh, is one of the popular websites that uh, lists what a candidate's positions are. Um, so I want to bring up a few uh, of the uh, notions about your views and have you clarify what it is you stand for. Uh, I just picked this tweet by a user named Amuse because it kind of boils it down to a lot of what I've heard. Um, he says, libertarians, by nominating Chase Oliver, the LP just alienated every Silicon Valley libertarian I know. I'm not sure what that means, but uh, their presidential nominee supports transitioning children, mask and vax mandates, men in women's sports, and open borders, uh, and then it has you uh, at, looks like maybe a gay pride parade holding a rainbow flag that says, don't tread on me, um, which I, I'm not sure that there's anything wrong with that picture unless you have a problem with gay people. But uh, let's start with transitioning children. Um, uh, what is your 
stance on puberty blockers, surgeries, so forth for children? So in terms of healthcare, I want to keep healthcare out of government's hands. I support parents making decisions for their kids. I'm not in support of transing kids. I'm in support of parents meeting with their doctor to determine the best healthcare decisions for their kids on a case-by-case basis, which the most common treatment for kids who are suffering from gender dysphoria under the age of 18 is merely socially transitioning. The fact is, is this is only a few thousand kids across the country when there's over half a million kids in foster homes right now who suffer far greater rates of abuse. But I'm always inclined leave healthcare to the decisions of a, of a patient, a doctor who they consult with, and if they are a parent, the child being the advocate for that parent. Now, so far, he has described it as healthcare. And some of you might be saying, because look at Liz, she can't wait. She's just on the edge of her seat, ready to pounce on him about this. What is it if your child is gender confused or even has ROGD, you know, social contagion type of gender confusion. How is that not healthcare? How is seeking a clinician, a therapist, or whatever, to talk to your child about what's going on, not healthcare? It is healthcare. Healthcare doesn't automatically mean someone's putting a pill in your mouth. Sometimes you go to the doctor, as I did not all that long ago, about a year ago, and I thought maybe I needed medication, whatever. My doctor handed me a book about nutrition, best doctor ever, and told me, you need to change your diet. I know you're probably thinking, wow, a doctor did it. Yes, but that was healthcare. That's actually healthcare, ironically, <laughs> because now I'm healthier because I followed her advice and I changed my diet and I lost almost 30 pounds. And that was healthcare, but it was a conversation and a recommendation of a book. So I do believe, and given other things that he says, that he is talking quite literally about it is between your clinician or the provider of the care that you're going to seek when your kid says, I'm super confused about whether I'm a boy or a girl, or I think I'm not a boy or a girl when I was born that way. Um, that is a decision between you and the parents. Now he says oh, it's only a few thousand nationwide. He's actually correct. What seems to us because of social media, libs of TikTok or whatever, it seems like hundreds of thousands of children are doing this. It's actually more like a few thousand. They get to the point where it's really like we need to go see a clinician and they're not just saying I'm non-binary. Because okay, remember, the non-binary kid is not seeking puberty blockers, generally speaking, or surgeries or whatever. They're just sort of claiming they're nothing for now, all right? And that actually is probably the majority when you start seeing all these kids saying stuff. The ones who just genuinely, sincerely say, no, I'm a girl, no, I'm a boy, you are talking in the thousands, not the tens of thousands or the millions. You're just not. It's been amplified. That doesn't mean it's not a serious, serious problem. It's a very serious problem. But we are seeing more kids, a higher percentage of kids whose family lives are being disrupted. They're being put into foster care. They're, you know, based on just clinical depression where the 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 government comes in and says, oh, we think your parents are not are neglectful, whatever. We're going to take you away. That happens more often and always has than some of these other issues. And as we're going to get into, the government is more likely to force at this point you to transition your child than to get in the way and, and stop it. And we wouldn't want that either, would we? We don't want the government forcing you to make a medical decision. So what he's saying is, I, I'm going to leave that up to the parents to decide what to do and do, you know, and I don't see how someone running for president would say anything different, but let's continue. And ultimately, a doctor should not be required by government nor insurance company or any kind of mandate to violate their oath or their uh, or, or their desire to help and heal. And remember, the complaint that we all have is that by using medical treatments on these minor children and not sharing full information with them about what's going to happen to them, they are violating their oath. Okay, they are. So he's explicitly saying he doesn't want that. So. Are you blaming the would-be president of the United States for saying, I just want parents and doctors to work it out and doctors shouldn't be violating their oath when doctors violate their oath? You, or are you going to blame the doctors for that? Period. I think when you frame it like healthcare, that sort of gives the entire game away, right? This is... Why? What game? When you frame it like healthcare, you're describing what it is. Somebody says, I'm confused about my gender. They need care. What is the kind of care that they need? Well, maybe it's mental health care, but it's still health care. 
it's the same as the argument that a lot of pro trans activists use, you know, talking about it in the form of, you know, you would you rather have a, you know, an alive. Do you see what she did there? She's adopting the the language of the 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 trans activists to use against him to find fault with him. So the fact that they twist language and the fact that they are saying, would you rather have a live, you know, son or a dead daughter or whatever, whatever the reverse is. Um, and they say, you know, don't get in the way of our health care. Doesn't change the principle underlying. Remember what they want when they say those things is they want government to force doctors to do it. They want government to force schools to recognize these non-real things that, you know, the people who say that, the doctors who say that, the, the therapists who say that, the activists who say that are asking the government to employ force. And she's using that and saying, well, oh, then, you know, you're just adopting that. No, he's not. He is using it correctly. They're using it incorrectly. We don't follow their, we don't suddenly have to change our language and, and because somebody else is doing something incorrect. you know, a, a dead son or an alive daughter, basically the, the implication being that if you disallow a child to transition, then, you know, the mental illness that the child will suffer from could end in suicide. And so, and that is wrong for the doctors to say that they are violating their oath of do no harm. What does that have to do with the president of the United States? Of course, what, you know, empathetic parent wouldn't make that decision in that case? Many, actually. Many empathetic parents don't just make that decision. So she's also being, you know, a little bit hyperbolic to say that every parent who hears that is going to go along with it. In fact, we know for a fact many don't, and they get in trouble with the state for not wanting to go along with it because the state is getting involved in their medical decisions. The state right now in the hand of Democrats, in the hand of totalitarians, you know, non-libertarians is, is getting involved in that healthcare decision, because more often than not, the parents are like, no, 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 I'm not okay with this. We're not going to affirm we don't want to do this. Oh, well, now we're going to take your kid and put it in post your child in foster care. They're being bullied by their doctors, their schools, uh, local politicians, school boards, you name it, even their own kids and their kids' friends and their kids' teachers. So this situation, what parent wouldn't do that? Actually, many is the answer. Is I think framing it as healthcare sells the detractors, some of whom are operating in very good faith, quite short. I mean, we just had Jesse Single on this podcast. And one point that Jesse makes time and time again is that the best evidence we have about tr tr gender transitions for children thus far comes from the CAS review, which... And we know that th the best way to have the CAS review take effect and be become the influential document for formulating health policy, public policy, is to go ahead and advocate for that where it matters, which is where? Not at the federal level, okay? Who licenses doctors? The state. Who licenses insurance companies? The state. Who sets mandates for what insurance companies have to cover or don't have to cover? The state, again. When I say the state, I mean like your state, like North Carolina, California, South Carolina, whatever. OK, not Washington, D.C. School policy, same thing, the state. <laughs> Professional associations, which are also operating with people who are licensed by their states. So she's not saying anything wrong. It's like, oh, well, the cash were. Yeah, great. She's talking to a presidential candidate. Which was just published in the United Kingdom, which really is pretty damning for a lot of the people on the side of doing this invasive these types of invasive treatments for children. And he said nothing different. She's operating as though he has said, I'm for trans and kids. He's not. So she's like arguing against somebody who isn't arguing with her. So like, as far as like, I, I could understand wanting to get the state out of it as much as possible, but like, how can you not look at it and sort of see a situation where we are just, you know, make, allowing. Allowing. The word allowing just came out of a libertarian's mouth. That that's what I you know, once I got to allowing, I was like, whoa. <laughs> allowing. Allowing. We're allowing. Well, 
the way that the proponents and the activists would talk about it is we're allowing parents to say no. We're allowing parents to, in some states, to not affirm their kids. That's abuse. How can we allow that? Well, obviously, I'm opposed to that, right? I'm opposed to somebody trying to force a parent to affirm. So, yeah, we're allowing them to say, no, I'm not going to do that. And we're not going to arrest them and take their kid away, at least in the states like Florida, that are, that are saying the government is not going to allow the state and its licensed agents and and credentialed people to force parents to do things because it's the parents' decision. But here she's like, we're allowing parents. It works both ways. Unfortunately, this is the story. Like I said, I don't, you know, I don't agree with everything parents do for their kids. But I don't want the long arm of the government to come in and force my opinions on them. And you might say, yeah, but dad, this is like permanently altering the kid. Wait till you hear what he says about permanent versus not permanent. And he did say that most kids are socially transitioned, which is also true. Now, we can get into the weeds and we can talk about how if they socially transition, they're more likely to medically transition and da, 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 da. But if you got them hooked up with the right therapist, that would be a lot less likely. And yet if you fight them tooth and nail and you go at them, you may not wear, you have to wear dresses every girl and you can't wear the pants and you can't change your name to Joe or whatever. Now you run the risk that you're creating a hostile environment with your child and you can't even start a dialogue. You can't even figure out what's going on with them. What is the underlying issue? How did they come to have this confusion? Because you're already battling with them, which is very different than affirming them. Allowing them to dress how they want and have the name that they want and just be like, okay, but you're not taking any drugs and you're not getting any surgeries. And it sounds to me like she wants somebody in the government to disallow that. That thing's a bit extreme to me. Minor, minors are making decisions and parents are making decisions for minors with the help of doctors, with the help of an activist class that has spurred this along in a way where we just like don't have longitudinal, good, high quality studies as to how this affects kids. This is not, again, nothing to do with the federal government. So she's saying a lot of true things to a presidential candidate. What do you want him to do? He's not, he, he's not running to be king. He's not ready to even be the head of the CDC to talk about longitudinal studies. He's not uh, going to be governor, so he would have a say in what's going on with your, you know, licensure and 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 all this kind of stuff. Now, I suppose you could say, well, he could get involved with, you know, making sure the FDA does this. And that. I suppose. So make that argument. She should be making that argument. Well, would you t- take steps to make sure that the cash review is applied to FDA policy when using drugs off label? That's a fair question. I'd like to ask him that question. She doesn't ask that question. Hey, I say let those studies take place and they should do so outside of the confines of government. Let independent organizations do these things. But in the meantime, you should be allowed to seek the health care you want. There's all kinds of medications. Guess what? Government said taking ivermectin was bad for you and many people just decided to do it anyway. They took the choice. They didn't want the government to ban that choice. Same with anything else related to COVID. We didn't want vaccine mandates on us. We didn't have to hold what our treatment has to be. We took care of our own lives. We need to apply that to every area of healthcare. This is exactly why it relates to healthcare, because it is a healthcare issue. This is not an issue that is any different from any other care that a physician, a patient needs. And when they're a minor, their parents are in charge of that. He keeps saying their parents are in charge of that. Their parents are in charge of that. This is what you want to hear from a candidate, isn't it, parents? The parents are in charge of that. That means if the parents say no, even if the doctor says, this is what I think you need, then that's what's going to happen because the government's not going to come in and force them or the the government DSS is not going to say, well, your doctor reported to us that you said no to the drugs and therefore we're coming to take your kid away as happens in California or some other places. And he's saying, no, we don't want that. And she seems upset because that leaves open the possibility. And yes, it does. That a parent with Munchausen's or who knows what else, BPD, devouring mother, whatever, is going to go doctor shop for a doctor who's going to say, here's some puberty blockers, here's some hormones for your eight-year-old, and that parent's going to take them and give them to their eight-year-old. And you and I would both find that to be absolutely horrific. But guess what validates that now and makes it more likely? Because remember, it's part of this whole social cult, social uh, contagion and and social credit. What makes it more likely now is that government is supporting that. 
and people derive the sense of power. If government al allows, if government protects the rights of parents to say, no, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that, then the person who is going to do it is the outlier again. The tables have flipped over and it's largely because of the threat of government. Parents are so afraid. I'm going to send my kid to school. If I, if I don't affirm, they're going to affirm. First of all, it's mandated in the schools in so many states. So they're going to do it, which fights against me. That puts me at odds with my kid. They don't have any recourse. If the government's out of it, that means guess what? It won't be going on in the schools either. But that's something you have to argue with your state about, because even if he won the presidency, he can't go into the state of California and say, hey, you can't run your schools this way. He can get rid of the Department of Education and stop funding them. But he can't make California change its constitution that he can't do. He's not the king. Parents can, uh, you know, have that sovereignty because they have unconditional love for their kids. They want to see their kids survive and thrive. They're going to be a better advocate than a board or a bureaucrat. And certainly one size fits all health care is not libertarianism. That is not freedom. We need to have the ability for individuals to choose what to do on a case by case basis. And like I said, this is being very overblown considering the most common treatment is social transitioning. These uh, these cases that are being brought forward make it seem like every kid who questions their gender is automatically thrown on puberty blockers or on hormone replacement therapy. It's just not telling the full truth. I recommend that detractors meet with families who have trans kids, as I have all over the country. I met a young I don't, person I don't who drove two fair. hours to see me. I don't think that's fair, right? Like I have, you know, a bunch of trans friends and I have parent friends because I'm also a parent who have had gender questioning children, right? Like to act as if it's like merely a lack of knowledge about this sells short the arguments that people like me are making, which is that I don't think it's freedom either to have a situation where we've very much had this activist class that has been highly successful. So what does she want to do? Shut up the activist class, like deprive them of free speech? Again, they are so successful because they dominate institutions that get funding from the government, whether it's universities, whether it's research grants, whatever it is, they're getting government funding. Government is for this. The UN is for this. The current government is partnered with the UN for Agenda 2030. The fact that government's involved now is why it is this bad. Getting out of all those relationships to the extent that the president can do it is actually going to make it better. The reason it's affecting these parents so much that she's talking about is because they're under a tremendous pressure that the government is going to take their kids away. That someone's going to accuse them of negligence and literally take their kid. They're afraid to lose their child. And still parents fight and still parents say no. So it's both an exaggeration that most parents are saying yes. And the ones who are saying yes are already statists. They're already people who are happy to vote for the government to tell you what to do. They like the fact that people other than them might be forced to trans their kids because misery loves company. This is a kind of a person. And it sounds like she's just saying, well, I want us to be the ones forcing them not to do this. How is that going to solve anything? That's what with influencing a lot of gatekeeper <clears throat> medical organizations in the United States to make it seem like the only acceptable way to treat a gender questioning kid is to socially transition them or to get them on puberty block. And when the grant money goes away and the federal funding for universities that are pushing this goes away, and when we pull out of the UN and our, the Agenda 2030 and UNESCO treaties and all this garbage, and when there's no longer this push all the way from the top and all the way down through all the states to make this the only acceptable choice, to let this activist class have that, that voice. Sanity has a chance to prevail. Coming in and exerting reverse force, I don't think is going to make them go away. Like, I mean, to me, that's so not freedom. To me, that's a very moneyed activist class that has... It is a moneyed activist class. What is your point? They're moneyed and they're activists. What power do you want to bring to bear to stop them? Do you literally want to deprive their free speech, prevent them from being activists, prevent to pull the government money out of it? Sure. But what else do you want the president of the United States to do? Really played a significant role in changing the narrative around this discussion when I don't understand why children in many cases couldn't just wait until they're actual adults.
And that is a conversation we're going to have a much easier time having with them and their parents and everybody when there isn't a groundswell of support from the government for the the for affirmation approach. I, I don't think she appreciates the degree to which the government is involved in the transing thing. Because if she did, she might realize that he would come in and dismantle such a giant chunk of their funding. He still won't get rid of all of it. There's some very moneyed interests that are really into it. But guess what they won't have at their disposal? Guns. The force of the police state. They will not be able to take your child away from you if you don't do what they want. They won't be able to force your kid to, to undergo all kinds of things. But it still is going to have to come from your governor and not your president. But he can take away federal grants. And can more fully make decisions for themselves. Because when you're dealing with minors, you are dealing with this challenge of like, well, to what degree should the parent be empowered to make decisions for the minor versus... Where does that stop? Where does that stop? Well, when you're dealing with minors, I mean, to what degree should we allow them to choose what kind of school they go to? I mean, they're minors. They can't make informed consent about being homeschooled. I mean, they're minors. How do you, you know, so they 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 want to eat a carnivore diet. I mean, should we let them? Should we, I mean, we shouldn't really allow that. We They should have this like balanced diet with vegetables and fruit and whatever and like that. Or, you know, to what degree should the parents decide that, uh, you know, they're, they're minors. They can't choose whether they want to go to church or not. They can't choose whether they want to... Uh, Pick something. Where does it end? This is supposed to be a libertarian. They're yes, they're minors, but parents are are not guilty until proven innocent. They are presumed to love their children, want to care for their children. If we start stepping in with all the things that you know the kid isn't making an informed decision about, they, maybe a parent pumps them full of antibiotics every time they get a sniffle. Because they have a compliant doctor that'll do that. You want to go into every home and make sure they're not doing that? Because that's really dangerous. Maybe the parent is all, you know, hopped up on every booster known to man, which we also would disagree with. You want to prevent them from doing that? You really want the government that up your business? It sounds like she does. Just to what degree does the minor child really need to take some time to actually become a full legal adult before making this choice? Well, we would all agree that, you know, morally and ethically, they should. And we would agree even that medically, this is way too big a decision. And we'll wait to see her what Chase has to say to that. But she's, again, she says all these things, but laced in there it, are words like allow and, you know, with a reminder, what do we want to allow the parents to do? And I'm just sitting there going, this is a libertarian. So here's the thing. You mentioned the gatekeepers of information and things like this. The best way to get rid of them is to tear down the gatekeepers and not have any. No National Institute of Health or FDA or CDC that's guiding this stuff. Let culture actually decide that. But I'm Free even market talking about, of, of minds decide that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm even talking about the APA and even the fact that like journalists have been instructed by like the Associated Press Style Guide, which is the style manual that all journalists use. And what does the president have to do with that? Does she want him to like censor the speech of the of the Associated Press? When the culture begins to change because the federal government is not funding all of these agencies and giving this giant honeypot of money to do these things, then the APA has got to make a decision. Because now there's going to be dueling narratives. The people who disagree with this, like Liz, like me, are going to have, you know, a little bit more freedom to speak because it's not going to be the FDA says, the CDC says, the National Institute of Health says, and the doctors are not going to feel like, oh, oh, I better do what the, you know, the, the government agencies are telling me to do. To use terms like gender affirming care, which again, when we begin to frame these things in certain terms, we're giving. She's doing it. He's not saying let's do that. In the entire argument, one side of the argument, we're sort of skewing things in favor of them, right? I, I believe we hear both sides. I believe we hear both sides of the argument quite a bit. And, and trust me, those are not government institutions. Any government institution shouldn't be trying to guide one thing one way or another. Let culture, free markets, and free minds do that stuff. And that's where that's going to come from. And you may disagree with how things are done. That's the free marketplace of ideas. And I support that. I support people having their own opinions on these things. I would never, ever try to tell you how to raise your kids. And I don't want to tell other parents how to raise their kids. And the reason that these ideas have been propagated is there has not been a free market of ideas precisely because you've had the National Institute of Health and the FDA and the CDC and, you know, the, the Surgeon General of the United States, who is very pro-trans and all of these things. And they have so dominated and that because the press is so like-minded, they're elevating that narrative and suppressing 
the other ideas. So what he's talking about is he's saying you don't censor those people. You don't fund them. You take away their funding. Maybe bye-bye PBS while we're at it. But, he, but and when you do that, the p- people like us who've been, you know, suppressed and made very quiet, suddenly we can be heard. And those parents who might be all scared and skittish about saying no are suddenly feeling emboldened like, you know what? I'm going to go with no Governor Newsom and Governor Waltz and all those governors that are all about you got to affirm. I'm going to go with no. And um, since there's no National Institute of Health and all these people are not saying this is the approved way from Washington to do things. uh, Yeah, good luck making your argument now. It hasn't been a free marketplace of ideas. Because that's not my job. My job is to reduce the size and scope of government and the abuses that exist. That's the presidency. All it was ever supposed to be. Should well, hold, let, let me let me drill. Hold on, Liz. Let me drill, drill down into what I see as the core of this. Maybe disagreements, because I think it's it's really important for libertarians to uh, think about, uh, you know, wh- where they stand on this issue. It's one of the big culture war issues right now, um, and it's important for parents. It's important for kids. Um, it's it's important for for everyone. That's why we did an hour and a half with. Jesse Single on this. And what I hear Liz saying is that there's been a very one-sided discourse about this and uh, people have been shut down from questioning the guidance, um, you know, call, kind of marginalized or called uh, bigots or transphobes. And- Would it matter though? And I'm a, I'm a drill, drill this point so many times just to make sure everybody gets it. Would it matter if we were silenced and censored in the AP and this and that, and we, you know, our opinion about how it's crazy, whatever, wasn't getting to the fore, but we still thought had it, we still felt it. If there was no risk of the government taking your child away from you, if that wasn't a possibility because there was no official government position on this issue, it was just cultural. It was just, you know, your neighbors might go big meanie. Okay. The Associated Press might say, you know, there's parents in California who won't transition their children. Aren't they terrible? But that's as risky as it gets. Now, your your job, you know, as your private employer might say, we don't want to employ you. What I mean, yeah, that's a risk. But, you know, government's not there to protect you from jerks who have different opinions than you. They could, they could think that about you for any reason. You drive a gas guzzling car and they don't like that. I mean, it could be any reason that somebody says, we don't want you working here anymore because you have opinions we don't like. They do that, but it's not the government's job to come in and stop them. Just how it is. I mean, okay. That's why not being censored is so important so that other ideas can ha- can co- compete. But when you're talking about the life of your child, I-, I like to believe that the vast majority of parents are not just caving in to social pressure. I'm sure some are. But I'd say the majority who are kind of like, okay, are genuinely and sincerely terrified that they will literally lose their child taken away where, as he points out, if they're put in in foster care, the risks to them are so much greater. So they may reluctantly go along with it in this kind of Faustian choice that I'm afraid DSS is going to take my kid. And in some states, that's a very real fear. So that'd be my question is like, do you really think that this would have the power that it has if that that government force weren't applied? And stuff like that. And what I hear Chase saying is that the libertarian position, uh, it, I, I mean, first of all, it sounds like Chase sort of agrees that, you know, free discourse is the is the part of the solution here, but also that um, the you have to decide who ultimately is the decision maker. Is it the state? Is it these bureaucratic boards or is it the parents when you're talking about a minor? Um, do you have a disagreement there, Liz, with his proposal that ultimately Given what we know now, the parents need to be the ones working in consultation with their doctors instead of the states, you know, putting these mandates forth. Is well, that? I, th- I mean, yeah. are you comfortable with the state allowing parents? Allowing again. The state allowing. Which state? He would be the president. And why should he take a position? on what they're doing in California publicly. If his position is principled, his position is, I think it's ultimately up to the parents. Does California think it's up to the parents? No, it does not. No, it does not. 
it says you must. Does Minnesota think it's up to the parents? No, they do not. They say it's up to the doctors. You don't have a choice. So that's just the flip side of the same coin that she's talking about. She doesn't want to allow the parents to decide in the affirmative, and they would be the minority of parents, okay? She doesn't want that. So she wants to give the state the power to disallow that. And like I said, where does that end? And he's saying, no, I, I'm going to take the risk that some kids unfortunately the parents are going to make a, a not great decision and the doctors might make a not great decision, but I would rather that than duplicate what California and Minnesota are doing in reverse. And he can't anyway, because he would be the president. And doctors to decide to follow a child's wishes and to surgically transition, like say they surgically transition an eight-year-old. Is no. that Okay. That's not happening, Liz. And you know it. Now I, you know, I hate people who gaslight and say these surgeries are not happening on minors. Oh, they absolutely are happening on minors, but they're not happening on eight-year-olds. Okay, they are giving eight-year-olds puberty blockers that they're doing, and while saying they're not, they are, and it's terrible and it's barbaric, and they shouldn't. And we should have an open dialogue, and we should be able to not just talk about how poisonous they are and get the cast review out there and all these kinds of things and pull money out of places that, you know, no Medicare for this, no Medicaid, no, none of the, the, like no government subsidies for any of these treatments whatsoever. You want to do this? You're going to pay for it on your own because we think it's that bad. I mean, you can talk all you want. You can say, I don't think this is a good idea, but there's a big difference between that and allow. And I think that's the part that she's missing here. But to, to go, if your argument requires you to say that they're like, what, literally surgically castrating little eight-year-old boys, that there are no breasts to remove. So what is she talking about? That's just not happening. Okay? It's it's a chemical process at eight. And, it, and I agree, it shouldn't be done. But I'd rather have that conversation with parents openly where they're not afraid of losing their kid than use government force. Surgical transition is for 18 and older. No, I, I've always okay. had the position that surgery is for 18 and older. And but I do why, want to say this. Why isn't it a situation where the parent gets to rule? Like, why does the state get to intervene in that case? <laughs> this I don't like when people do this. But why in this case? Okay, do you, well, you want to open up everything that's 18 or older? Tattoos, uh, piercings without apparent consent. Um, tattoos you can't do. Uh, you know, owning a, a gun. I mean, like, wh what do you want to do, Liz? Come on. We as a society have decided that 18 is the age of maturity. I think it should be older personally, but, you know, for all the things, because I don't think these kids are mature at 18, but if we're going to send them off to war, which we shouldn't do either, uh, we should get rid of selective service registration. But if that's the age at which their country could say, you got to go do a thing, okay, then yeah, I, I think 18 would be the age. They're also finished with any kind of formal schooling that the government is making them do or compelling them to have notified that they've done. And until such time as he can get rid of that or some other libertarian can get rid of that, that's the age. So here we are, Liz. <laughs> and it's it's not that it's magical. It's just aligned with all the things. Okay? Well, I want I just want to speak to that last thing that Zach said, saying that there are people who are saying, well, you're a bigot or you're a hater, and that's dividing the question up and that's creating division. It, the same division happens when people say that parents of trans kids are child abusers, groomers, that they're pedophiles. These kinds of accusations come from the other side of that argument. We're going to have real open discourse with free, open discourse, transparent information, and actually discussing the issue instead of attacking each other. That has to come from both sides of this issue. There's huge division here, and I'm somebody who is willing to reach my hand out I will listen to just about anybody if it can be done with respectful discourse without creating, you know, narratives that, well, you believe this way, so you must immediately be this. That is not the way to go about freedom and free discourse. That is just insulting each other. And I would say, if you look at the discourse that's been happening between me and the people who have been commenting, who has been throwing more hatred and division out there? I've been called all kinds of things by people who don't like me. And guess what I haven't been doing? Returning fire, because I know that that is not a way to constructively build a conversation. And when they want and when folks want to have a constructive conversation, I'll be right here waiting to have it. Yeah. So I'm here having that conversation. What is your response to why the state should like, why would the state be the decision maker with regard to surgical transitions after age 18? It's not the state that's the decision maker. It's the now adult child is the decision. They're now an adult. 
the state is just recognizing that they're an adult. It's not that they're they're having a conversation with the state. That's the part that she's like mischaracterizing. The state simply recognizes you as a mature adult. You you are not anymore legally bound to your parents. They you know don't owe you anything. You don't owe them anything. It, it's a it's a legal separation at eighteen. It's all voluntary after that point. That's all that's happening is the state's going, yep, you're 18. Oh, there's your birth certificate. Okay, you're 18. That's all that is happening. And now that adult is making his or her own decision about surgery. Could be a wrong decision. Happens all the time. There are adults who seek transition surgeries and things go wrong and it wrecks their lives and it's tragic. And had they gotten better information because it was a free exchange of ideas when they were younger and there wasn't censorship because it was so very profitable through government grants, et cetera, so forth, to be pushing this garbage, maybe they wouldn't have ended up in that situation. But what are you going to do? Are you going to now start telling people who are over 18 they can't modify their bodies? Do you really want the government to get involved in that? Versus the parent. Like, like why Because I parent... always involve it. Please. Yeah. Yes, because surgery is 100% irreversible procedure, and puberty blockers and HRT, while not perfect, have been shown to have uh, be mostly reversible, and you can get off of them. And surgery, just like tattoos, and frankly, if you're, uh, you know, I'm against circumcision personally, I believe that's also body modification, uh, but I would like to see that done for adults, if, if at all possible, without, of course, religious exemption for that last thing I mentioned there, but everything else should be up to an adult to be making those decisions. It's why my uh, 16-year-old niece, when she was 16, she said she wanted to get a tattoo. And they said, nope, you're not getting that. Uh, in regards to any other kind of body modification, we've set the standard of adulthood, and it should continue to be the standard for body modification surgery. Well, you've but, heard it here is, first. That uh, is a situation, the, the, though. The anti-circumcision where... movement, uh, Chase where... Oliver is your man. Um, now, I, I want to uh, But take I do down think it's less inconsistent, okay. right? Because, like, why should the state prevent that? Right. If a parent, if there's a 16 year old minor child and the parent and the doctor, like, why is it that we're not using the same logic that we use with puberty blockers? Because it's permanent. Because it's permanent. That's why. Because now it, it is nearly impossible to be sure that this minor child fully understands the ramifications of this surgery. And I'm a, I'm really torn on this one because. I think given the consequences, st sterilization, lack of sexual function, uh, death, <laughs> you know, like it, high probability of infection and death, I think, you know, holding it to 18 is appropriate because then they really understand. And you can be more sure they've had the full amount of time to go through other kinds of therapy to, you know, make sure this is really what they want to do. Um, that's different than, let's say, getting a nose job. It is permanent to get a nose job. And I suppose theoretically you could die, you know, complications, but you're not sterilized and losing your sexual function from it. Okay. I mean, you know, some teenagers do get that. There are teens, uh, I've known some who get breast reduction surgery because they, they're, they're, they're athletes, things get out of hand and, and, um, puberty. And now they keep, they're really struggling, uh, with running and doing different things. They don't want their triple quadruple D, whatever. And they want to get a re reduction for their back and for their health. And they talk it over with the doctor and they're 16 or 17 and they get it done. And I do think that that potentially should be, you know, uh, uh an exception, um, you know, because, there are those circumstances. That's a decision where I really don't want the state getting involved. But when we're talking about these gender surgeries, these sex surgeries, sex reassignment surgeries, I hate that name, but whatever you want to call it. Uh, first of all, it's experimental. It's still experimental. And secondly, um, the, you're dealing with a mentally ill person. Get, I get a nose job or I get a breast reduction. It's not because I'm mentally ill. It's a health decision. A lot of kids, what happens is they have a deviated septum and while they're there, they're like, can you take the bump off my nose, whatever. So that sometimes happens. And again, we're talking about like 16 and 17 year olds here, not, you know, 13 year olds mostly. Um, but it's not because they're mentally ill. And having a person who is demonstrably mentally ill making such a big decision before they're 18, now you have a double whammy. Now he doesn't say that. He doesn't mention that. But Liz ought to know there's a difference between 
you know, that and some other kind of surgery and whatever. It's not that it's the magical age of 18. It's just after 18, you really don't have much of a leg to stand on. They are not literally a danger to others. It's not that kind of mental illness. Um, you could argue they're a danger to themselves, I suppose. And maybe over time we'll be able to make that argument. I think it's gonna be tough to do though. But before 18, for sure not. For sure not. No, I lost Personally, I believe that's also body modification. Uh, but I would like to see that done at, for adults, if, if at all possible, without, of course, religious exemption for that last yeah, thing I mentioned. Where he was oh, the anti-circumcision where... movement, uh, Chase where... Oliver is your man. Um, now, I, I want to... Uh, but I do down think that's the... inconsistent, okay. right? Because, like, why should the state prevent that, right? If a parent, if there's a 16-year-old minor child and the parent and the doctor, like, why is it that we're not using the same logic that we use because with... Because they're mentally ill, Liz. ...or HRT because related they're mentally to surgical transition? Like... Because physical That's removal of a body part is different than taking a medication. It shouldn't be that difficult to see. It's two entirely different kinds of healthcare treatments. And one of them is a far more drastic treatment that should be reserved for adults. But we don't want the state involved in healthcare decisions at all. We want the state involved in healthcare decisions up until age 18, like, or... I think that's inconsistent. So we have we have an age of adulthood for all kinds of things like tattoos. I don't want I don't want kids getting tattoos. I don't want kids deciding uh, that uh, getting a nose job or getting a boob job or anything like that. I think that can wait until you're 18 year old and you as an adult can determine that for yourself. Well, I, like I said, I disagree with him on that one because there are health reasons where it might be justified, but we're and we're also not dealing with a mentally ill person making that decision. Okay, it's not. You might say you know breast enlargement. <laughs> It's not going to permanently alter literally the health of the person. This is what's missing in this debate that I kind of frustrated me on, on both of their parts. You are a permanent patient. You get these surgeries. It's not like you're all better. Bye. Like it is with, you know, breast reduction, or even breast augmentation or a nose job. You're not a permanent patient. You're not, don't have to permanently be on certain kind of medications and you aren't setting yourself likely up for more surgeries, skin grafts, complications, infections, and other assorted things. Um, because it's experimental. So the fact that it's experimental, the fact that they're operating on a mentally ill person, the fact that, that you know, uh, the, you're a permanent patient the rest of your life uh, with these surgeries. This is not getting mentioned. So she's falsely, you know, making a false equivalence um, between the healthcare decisions that a parent might make for a, a drug that you can't, you can go off the hormones. You can. The puberty blockers are not reversible if you've been on them for a long time. If you've been on them for a very short time, they are reversible. It just depends how long, when they're started. There's a lot of factors. I'm against them. Do not hear me saying I'm for it. I'm not. I'm just saying that it is fundamentally different than the surgery, and she keeps wanting to make it the same. That's up to you to do. And I've always had that standard, and I always will. You can say it's inconsistent, but surgery is very different than medical treatment via medicine. Hey, thanks. All right, so that was that's what he said. Now, as I said, there are little pieces that I don't fully agree with him on that I think you know I'd love to have a conversation with him and get into some of the nuances of this. But at the same, as much as I want to, it's more like on a personal basis just to have a conversation with him. But from a policy standpoint, if, if I'm looking at, you know, the position of the person who's running for president, I don't have any problems with this because it's not his purview in the first place. He said all the right things. He said NIH, CDC, FDA, yeah, no, federal grants, no. So get anything that the federal guy, you can bet your bottom dollar, he's not going to demand that Title IX force schools to put boys in the girls' bathroom and boys and girls' sports. They didn't get into the sports thing, did they? But I'm um, pretty sure that he doesn't want the government forcing that. And currently, that's why it's a problem. It's a problem in schools. Schools are run by the government or licensed and, you know, uh, classified as a school and so on by the government. It's government force largely if it's a private school and they decide to do that, don't go there, okay? But if it's a public school and they're forcing the boys into the girls' bathroom and vice versa, that's a government issue. But it's a state government issue. It's not a federal government issue. Right now, you've got uh, Biden-Harris that tried, they're failing, thank God, for the courts. They're trying to force the states in exchange for their federal money to allow the girls and the boys sports and change Title IX. Thankfully, they're losing. But 
that's government trying to force the position. He's saying, I don't want government to have anything to do with it. Well, that'll go away pretty quick. And every college and every university where that doesn't want to do that is not going to do it. And if you don't want your kid to go to a school that would do it voluntarily, don't send them there. And that's how we get rid of it is with our feet. We vote with our feet. We don't send our kids to schools that do this stuff voluntarily. But right now you don't have a choice because government's forcing you to. So to those who've been sending me, you know, you know, do you know that he supports trans and kids? Uh, no, he doesn't. Hope I've demonstrated that. And secondly, while you may disagree with some of the nuances of his thoughts on puberty blockers or whatever, you should take comfort in the fact that whatever his views about them are, he's not remotely interested in getting involved in the decisions at the state level like the Democrats. Okay? He doesn't want the government to have the power to force you or deny you or deny you the, the ability to make any kind of a healthcare decision for your child. And isn't that what we really want is a government that says, I want government to be in your life less. Then you can have that battle with your doctor and not worry about the FBI showing up at your house because they disagree with what you and your doctor have decided. Or worse, where you're afraid that your doctor is going to rat you out to the FBI <laughs> because you disagree with what the doctor's prescribing. Okay? So I just, I had to get that off my chest because, um, you know, I'm really flabbergasted. I talk about all these issues with regard to kids and schools and, and I keep telling people like, you don't want force is what you don't want. You don't want government co-parenting with you. You don't want, you want your parental rights back. Government doesn't give them to you. You want them back. You have them by birth. Okay. And, and the birth of your child. And Shouldn't you be demanding of your candidates, not that they agree with you about every position or medical decision you would make for your kids, but that they don't see it as their job to force you to agree with them? Because that's kind of where I stand. Yeah, I don't care if they agree with me or don't. I don't care if you guys agree with me or don't. I don't want to force you into doing something, and I don't want you to force me into doing something. And if you genuinely have evidence that I'm somehow like abusing my child or somebody else has evidence that they're abusing your child, then the onus should be on them to bring the evidence to the appropriate authorities. It should never be an automatic. Right now it's an automatic in some states. Mom and dad disagree with this medical decision. They are neglectful. Mom and dad don't want to affirm they're abusive. And the only people who have the power to do that so automatically are those with police power. And that's the state. So if you don't want kids being transed, you don't want the state involved in medical decisions, even if that means some parents are going to make decisions that you find abhorrent. And they probably do now about other things. So thanks for watching. Thanks for, for listening. And I hope I've cleared this up. I hope I've given you something to think about. Uh, go ahead. Let me have it in the comments. <laughs> I'm sure you will. And uh, please like, share, and subscribe. That's the video.